Welcome to the Bothell City Council meetings of, of September 19th, 2017. Uh, we're gonna have the Bothell Honor Guard provide us with the Pledge of Allegiance. Okay, so uh, thank you for that. That was that was great. Uh, meeting agenda approval. Is there any changes to tonight's meeting agenda? Councilmember Spivey. Great, thank you, Mayor. I was wondering if, uh, since there's so much similarity uh, in the new business, if we could uh, somehow come, with the exception of the small cell deployments, all the franchise agreements have one presentation and then they can point out the differences between those um, those different franchise agreements at that point. But in the packet, it they were all very, very similar agreements and just for um, some efficiency, maybe we can do that. That's how it's intended to be presented. It's gonna be one overarching um, uh, presentation with both small cell and uh, franchise agreements for other telecommunications agencies. So it's contemplated that way. Okay, great, thank you. All right, Councilor Samberg. I'd like to pull the vouchers for August 1st through September 1st and have them on uh, next week's uh, the consent agenda. Yeah, we get our packet, um, we get the vouchers, but we didn't actually have them attached this week, so it's hard to approve something we haven't seen. Thank you for pointing that out. Is there Mr. any Mayor. other changes? Oh, Councilor Spivey. Yeah, I've, um, last meeting I asked to have a discussion about uh, park mitigation fee. Uh, because it was getting late, we moved, post, kind of postponed it till this meeting. It's not on here. I'd still like to have that discussion. So you want to add it to the the end of the meeting again? Sure, that's fine. I hope that we get to it. I know the city manager wanted to, to talk to that because they haven't really had time to um, prepare for it. So it'll just be an information sharing amongst the council. We'll have the discussion go from there. Okay. Thank you. All right. Seeing no other changes for tonight's meeting agenda, the uh, projected agenda. Councilmember Sandberg. I prepared a statement so that I wouldn't blather on, so if you indulge me as I read it, um, I would appreciate it. Last week, council voted on the passage of one of our new acronyms, DUFIRA, the Downtown's Utility and Frontage Improvement Reimbursement Area, and that failed in a tied vote. We made amending motions which received unanimous support for example, removing administrative fees and collecting payment at certificate of occupancy. But some members had concerns about the cost to property owners and developers. The deputy mayor made an amending motion to reduce the assessment by 10%. Um, and that was an attempt, I think, to reflect the concerns about costs. 
All of the property owners stood before us and said they were willing to pay for their fair share of the right-of-way improvements, but preferred to pay for a Honda version rather than a Cadillac version, what, which was designed and built through the downtown master planning process. Our action last week has the property owners now paying for no version. They get all of their right-of-way improvements for free, um, so not paying for either a Honda or a Cadillac version, which is not fair to taxpayers who essentially prepaid for the improvements. It's also not fair for the developers who have already paid for their front end improvements. So um, Councilmember Freed and I discussed what kind of compromise could be proposed and we arrived at a percentage reduction that we felt was defensible. Um, the city attorney also explained to us in the meeting last week that council at its discretion could apply um, any percent reduction it so chose. So we talked about um, a proposal to bring back, to be brought back to council. Um, and then um, we, we discussed several versions, you know, t changing the calculation method from lineal street frontage to buildable square footage, but decided that that departed from our current practice too much and would generate more work for staff. So um, a number, we, we arrived at a, a particular percentage, which I'll share with you in a moment, but um, what um, we need to do, and I discussed with our city attorney and our city manager, is have a procedural mechanism to bring this back and for, for council consideration because our protocol manual does not allow a reconsideration vote on, um, this, uh, on this item because it was uh, a public hearing. So um, I would ask the city attorney if he could um, explain the mechanism by which we could bring it back and what I need tonight essentially are four, four votes, um, a council majority to bring this back as an old business item, as was explained to me, and I'm sure the city attorney can explain more eloquently. I mean, you did a pretty good job. So um, so basically, um, just for everyone listening at home and in the audience, um, <clears throat> up to three council members are allowed to discuss city business um, outside of the dais, um, and, it, and such discussion does not violate the Open Public Meetings Act. It's only if four or more members were to have that discussion. So Council Member Sandberg indicated she spoke only to Council Member Freed. Obviously two is less than four, so I don't believe that there is a violation of the OPMA here. Regarding the question that Council Member Sandberg has posed, um, it's my uh, understanding that if one person were to make a motion and it got seconded, and it was approved by at least four council members to direct the city manager uh, to bring this item back as old business prior to the end of the year. Um, if that's what the majority of council decides, then that would allow the item to be returned. Um, it would then be scheduled again for a public hearing. There would be um, essentially two touches. The first would be a resolution on a consent agenda that would set the date for the final action. Assuming that people would want to then speak publicly about that, the city would simultaneously schedule a public hearing for that second date at which the ordinance could be discussed and again by will of council uh, possibly adopted. So the procedure for tonight would be there would be need to be a motion uh, to bring the matter back as old business prior to the end of the calendar year. That would have to be seconded. You would then have discussion and then it could be voted on. Um, and it's a little bit of a departure from the normal procedure to put something on projected agenda but because if the will of council, if, as represented by a majority, directs the city manager to bring something back by the end of the year, um, it would then be, that would be the will of council that staff would then follow. Um, so um, we did arrive at a particular percentage. I don't know if council member Freed would like to talk about that, but I think it's important for us, for, for all of council, if you, to, for you to feel comfortable voting for such a thing to know the the very um, specific and discreet change that we're making that we're not intending to open a can of worms we're not intending on sending staff down a rabbit hole and do a lot more work um, it, to make this change and I'll let council member Freed speak to that so you don't have the floor I mean yeah I'm sorry you have the oh. floor but you're not the chair so you can't oh. hand off the so you, you have your chance with the projected agenda and then we need to move on to the next council member okay so then I have to make a motion correct okay so um, I will make a motion and I, if I have a second, then. Second. Oh, well, well, wait, wait. You'll okay. make so, it first. Okay. Um, so I would like to make a motion to add 
to um, the projected ending, a uh, projected agenda sometime before the end of the year as a consent agenda item to adopt a resolution establishing a public hearing on the downtown utilities and frontage improvements reimbursement area, directing staff to prepare an agenda bill that includes number one, a 35% reduction in assessment rate for the entire area um, from the rate that was discussed at the September 12th meeting. Uh, number two, removal of unqualifying administrative costs. And number three, a change in language to reflect collection of fees at certificate of occupancy. Second. Okay, so there's a, a motion and a second. I, I can't repeat that, but I think everybody gets the gist of the motion. And for purposes okay. of clarity, I believe it was the September 5th meeting. Oh, September 5th, I'm sorry. So it's, if it's okay with the council, I would like to ask the city manager if there's uh, bandwidth within the organization to take this back up and not have other items fall off the uh, agenda. Is everybody okay with that? Because we'd have a motion in a second. Okay. Um, based on the way it's been presented by council member Sandberg, it appears that the um, work has been narrowed down to one specific change, which is reducing the amount of the assessment by 35%. And so that limits our work. So thank you for being cognizant of that and not looking at the, changing the formula or anything like that. And so um, we believe that can be done in the time period that you're asking for. Okay, so is there any discussion on the motion? Council members, uh, Freed? Great, thank you. The last time that we had the opportunity to discuss this, I had some concerns that were being brought up regarding the addendum or amendment, sorry, uh, that were being discussed. One was to allow developers to if they damage the frontage that they could then fix it, but the expenses that they put into fixing it could go back to reduce the fees that they paid. I thought that was a potential black hole of some accounting issues that could arise, some administrative fees from their own companies that could be thrown in to get that number as high as possible. Um, and then there were some other reductions that were discussed. As we further look into the numbers, uh, it seemed to me that a 35% reduction got us to more of a north of just halfway of what the developers were asking to where the city was. So it seemed like a fair uh, a movement toward them. And I do think it's right for us as city council and as a city to go back to the developers who are receiving a great benefit to their developments. So oftentimes when a development occurs, the frontage is improved and that frontage improvement could wait for their neighbor to improve 10 to 15 to 20 years in the future. With the investments that we made in downtown Botha with the boulevard, with other roads and, and storm utilities and such, we've done an amazing job of creating a vibrant downtown where developers want to be. So it seems only right that their property values have increased because of those investments that we've made as a city. So it's only right in my opinion to get back um, some latecomer fees from them. So the compromise that Council Member Sandberg and I discussed, I think she very clearly stated and certainly something I hope the council has majority supports. Council Member Spivey? I, I had a question. You, you said September 5th. Well, I missed what the September the 5th was in reference to. Uh, that was when the vote was taken. Okay. The three, right. three to one vote was taken. Right. No, I don't have it. I don't, um, I'm good. Thank you. Any other discussion on the motion? Council Member Sandberg? And just to be clear, we're not talking about um, tonight adopting that 35% proposal. What we're talking about is putting, a, you know, having a two-step process where we adopt a resolution to conduct a public hearing. I don't know, that percentage might change. I thought it was a good idea to build on what the deputy mayor had um, proposed earlier, and I think it's a good idea to um, collect somehow on those improvement fees, uh, the, those assessment, those, um, those right-of-way um, costs have cost the city, or were, excuse me, assessed to the property owners um, was about $1.8 million. We're not gonna recoup $1.8 million, um, but whatever we do recoup, even if it is a much reduced amount, is, is important for us to recoup so that we can continue to, you know, reinvest that money elsewhere in the city. Okay, anybody, anybody else? Motion is on the floor, so go ahead and place your vote. Passes uh, four to, well wait, five to two with Councilmember McNeil in abstaining. And so is there anybody else would like to add or change the projected agenda? Seeing none, we'll go into the um, review the public engage engagement opportunities.
maybe. Maybe next week. <laughs> okay, that's all right. We can move on. So special presentations. We first have the swearing-in ceremony of Chief, Chief Kroon. Uh, and there's a reception to follow. So City Manager. members of the council, friends and family of our new chief. Um, there's some really fun things you get to do as city manager, and I would consider this um, a true honor to be able to um, swear in our new fire chief. And so I have a pledge um, for you. Um, today, in the presence of all those gathered here. Today, in the presence of all those gathered here. I, state your name. I, Bruce Crone. Having accepted the position of fire chief. Having accepted the position of fire chief. Do hereby pledge to support the mission and values. Do hereby pledge to support the mission and values of the city of Bothell. Of the city of Bothell. And the Department of Fire and EMS. And the Department of Fire and EMS. As fire chief. As fire chief. I will serve my organization. I will serve my organization. With respect and dignity. With respect and dignity. To serve the citizens of Bothell. To serve the citizens of Bothell. With compassion, courage, and integrity. With compassion, courage, and integrity. I do solemnly swear. I do solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States. That I will support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of Washington. And the Constitution of the State of Washington to uphold the laws, rules, and regulations. To uphold the laws, rules, and regulations of the City of Bothell. Of the City of Bothell. And that I will faithfully discharge the duties. And I will faithfully discharge the duties of the Office of Fire Chief. Of the Office of Fire Chief at the City of Bothell. At the City of Bothell. According to the best of my ability. According to the best of my ability. This is my pledge. This is my pledge. That those here today witness and assist me. That those here today witness and assist me. In this promise of effort. In this promise of effort. Loyalty and sacrifice. Loyalty and sacrifice. So that I may witness. So that I may witness. And assist them. And assist them. In times of need. In times of need. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations. Thank you. Very Welcome much. to the city of Bothell. Thank you. This is actually kind of overwhelming, and I'll try to do this quickly before I lose it all. Um, I just have a, just a couple of remarks, but I know I would forget it in, in looking at everybody out here. So I'll try not to look at everybody. Um, so as I related to our fire personnel earlier, um, I am both humbled and honored uh, to have been hired as the fire chief of the city of Bellevue uh, Fire and EMS. Uh, becoming the, the fire chief is a capstone of my career goals. Can't do any better. Um, while the path I took here was not what I really had intended, I am glad I'm here. I'm so glad that I wound up here. I really appreciate the feeling of team that I've experienced here at Bellevue, and I already feel uh, right at home. Oh, that would be Bothell. <laughs> Obviously, I'm a little nervous. All right. Um, thank you for that, though. I'm sorry. I apologize. Um, I, I, you know, I have a, a several... Um, um, actually, I'm, I'm quite overwhelmed by the showing here. Um, um, I was going to try to get through this. Um, uh, uh, good friends. <sighs> My daughter is getting married in, in December. I'm not going to make it. It's not going <laughs> to Okay, so I've got the... Uh, uh, great friends and family here uh, that supported me throughout the years. I wouldn't be here without them. Uh, I just want to just acknowledge a few of them, just uh, um, just because uh, um, immediate family. My son Thomas and his wife Louisa, and my daughter Victoria and her uh, fiance Ryan, and my son um, Jonathan's at school, uh, which I shall not name. And then um, my other son Max I had to work tonight. But uh, most importantly, I would not be here uh, with the un without the unwavering support of my beautiful wife, almost. 32 years, T.
it's tough doing public speaking, isn't it? <laughs> Not cut out for everybody. Um, so I believe the reception is now, so anybody that would like to go to the reception, go ahead and uh, head out the door there. Is there bagpipes? Or there might be bagpipes? Okay, we canceled the bagpipes, darn it. <laughs> I was excited. I was excited about the big things. Um, but we're going to continue our meeting because we have a whole bunch of stuff on our agenda. Uh, but welcome, Chief. We're really ha uh, glad to have you and appreciate uh, you uh, coming to Bothell. Thank you. So we're going to uh, move on to the proclamations, and I have two, so I'm going to go down to the podium. Okay, that's a tough act to follow, but let's do uh, the first proclamation is a proclamation uh, designating se September 25th through October 1st as Diaper Awareness Week in Bothell, and I have Claudia Moline, are you here? Go ahead, come on up. So I'll read it here. Uh, um, Whereas diaper need the condition of not having a sufficient supply of clean diapers to ensure that infants and toddlers are clean, healthy, and dry can adversely affect the health and welfare of infants and toddlers. And whereas national surveys report that one in three families experience diaper need at some point, and whereas the average infant and or toddler requires an average of 50 diapers changes per week over three years, and whereas a supply of diapers is generally an eligibility requirement for infant toddlers to participate in childcare programs and quality early education programs, and whereas the people of Bothell recognize that addressing diaper need can lead to economic opportunity for the state's low-income families and can lead to improved health for families and their communities, and whereas Bothell is proud to be home of, to various community organizations that recognize the importance of diapers in helping providing economic stability for families and dispute distribute, excuse me, and diapers <laughs> to low-income families through various channels and receive thousands of diapers from Eastside Baby Corner to help families in Bothell. Now, therefore, I, Andrew John Rayum, the mayor of the city of Bothell, do hereby proclaim the week of September 25th through October 1st, 2017, as Diaper Need Awareness Week in the city of Bothell, Washington, and encourage the citizens of Bothell to donate generously to diaper banks, diaper drives, and those organizations that distribute diapers to families in need to help all alleviate diaper need. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Here you go. That's for you. Thank you. Yeah. Did you have a couple words? Just today? a couple of okay, words. Go ahead. Um, I just wanted to say a couple of words. Number one, to thank the city of Bothell for recognizing diaper need. Um, it is a huge need. Most of us can't imagine um, having to choose between diapers and food. And literally, that's what happens to families who are in need. Because of that, they frequently don't change children when they need to be changed, which leads to things like diaper rash, which leads to children who are not happy, which puts stress on the parents, and it's just a terrible cycle. And for those of you who do not know, food stamps cannot be used to buy diapers. So it puts families in a terrible, in a terrible position of trying to figure that out. For 27 years, Eastside Baby Corner has been providing that kind of support to families in need. Diapers is the number one thing we give out, and we guarantee that if somebody asks for it, we'll get it uh, so that people have that. So we have five items that we guarantee, and diapers is our number one. So if you have the opportunity to work with an organization that helps families in need, think about diapers. It's a, it's a huge need. Thank you. Thank you yeah, so much. Thank you. All right. The next proclamation is uh, designating September eight, designating September 18th through the 24th, 2017, as the National Pollution Prevention Week in Bothell. Whereas the United States Environmental Protection Agency acknowledges National Pollution Prevention Week in honor of the United States Congress passing the Pollution Prevention Act in 1990. 
And whereas the Pollution Prevention Act encourages pollution prevention by reducing or eliminating waste at the source by uh, modifying production processes, promoting the use of non-toxic and less toxic substances, implementing conservation techniques and reusing materials rather than putting them into the waste stream. And whereas the city's city council's environmental goal is to protect the natural environment through integrated natural resources management, and whereas the city of Bothell is a leader implementing programs and uh, processes to prevent pollution such as, but not limited to, local source control business audits, uh, food service, fats, oils, and grease inspections, solid waste recycling and compost, surface water programs like natural yard care. And whereas, that's a lot less than last year. I remember last year was like a, <laughs> Two paragraphs. Okay, so whereas these services are provided by the diverse workforce with a variety of backgrounds and experience levels that share a common goal of protecting public health and the environment by reducing or eliminating pollutants or contaminants from entering any waste stream or our environment, including the wetlands, streams, and lakes. We have lakes. Oh, I guess we do have Lake Pleasant, don't we? <laughs> Sorry. Okay, now, therefore, I, Andrew John Raymond, the mayor of the city of Bothell, do hereby proclaim the week of September 18th through the 24th, 2017, as National Pollution Prevention Week in the city of Bothell, Washington, and call upon all citizens to protect natural resources by reducing and eliminating sources of pollution. All right. Do you guys have you. something you want to say? <laughs> you want to add to it? No, no we're good. Everything. No. <laughs> Public Works doesn't like adding stuff to it. <laughs> So next on our agenda is the public comment period. I have a little thing in our protocol manual I read, so here we go. Each person addressing the council will give his or her name in an audible tone of voice for the record, and unless the council grants further time, shall limit the address to three minutes. No person other than the council and the person having the floor will be permitted to enter into any discussion, either directly or through a member of the council without the permission of the mayor. I have some sign-up sheets here. First is Julian Lowe. Good evening, Mayor, Deputy Mayor, Council Members. Julian Lowe, Local Government Affairs and Public Policy Manager with Puget Sound Energy. I'd like to provide a quick update for the Council Members, staff, and uh, residents gathered here on the rate case. Puget Sound Energy, the Washington Utilities Transportation Commission, Montana's Attorney General's Office, the Sierra Club, and six other entities have reached a settlement on a majority of issues in PSE's general rate case. The settlement will be filed with the WUTC and reviewed by three commissioners. Commissioners will then approve, reject, or modify the agreement. For a minimal increase in customer electric rates, the settlement will help PSE provide cleaner energy and increase funding available for customer bill assistance and weatherization. If approved, customers' electric rates will increase approximately 1% and decrease natural gas bills approximately 4%. The settlement would establish financing, a financing mechanism for decommissioning and remediation needed to shut down PSE's coal-fired coal strip units 1 and 2 and sets aside funding to pay for shutdown and cleanup costs for coal strips units 3 and 4. Shutdown is scheduled for July 2022. At the latest, no shutdown dates have been established for units three and four, which are newer and more efficient units. Also, a $10 million fund to help the community of Coal Strip transition is also part of the settlement. Details haven't been finalized, but we envision the transition will include economic development and job training for existing community members. The schedule for depreciating investments on coal strip units 3 and 4 has been accelerated from a period ending in 2045 to one ending in 2027. This doesn't mean closure of units 3 and 4 in 2027, rather it means the money invested in the units will be recovered by then. The settlement is continuing a mechanism to set aside money to help people pay for storm damage. PSE wants to provide services that customers can count on, including before, during, and after storms. Unresolved issues in the settlement include a mechanism to encourage conservation and service reliability. These remaining issues will be debated before a WUTC commissioner who will make a final decision. Again, if uh, Mayor, Deputy Mayor, Council Members, if you have additional questions, staff, um, please feel free to reach out to me at any time. Thank you. 
Thank you. Next is Wayne Clark. Good evening. My name is Wayne Clark and I'm a PGA golf professional. I've spent the last year working at Wayne Golf Course. For more than 80 years, Wayne Golf Course has been used by the public as an affordable golf option. It is by no means a fancy golf course that draws national attention, but this golf course has served the needs of many people in the Northwest and several of them are here tonight. We hear from people every day that Wayne Golf Course is where they learned how to play this game. The playability, affordability, convenience and relaxed atmosphere that define Wayne Golf Course is unprecedented in this area and gives residents as well as out-of-towners a reason to visit Bothell. This past year I've seen several proud fathers and grandparents bring out their young daughters and sons for their first round of golf. The joy in the child's face to chase a little white golf ball down the fairway and sit with dad for a burger and soft drink after their round is why we are here. What an opportunity to see these young people put down their electronics, enjoy nature, get some exercise, and learn a game that they can enjoy for a lifetime. Our men's and women's golf associations give many of our residents an opportunity to enjoy the camaraderie and health benefits that golf provides for them on a regular basis. And Wigan Golf Course is also host to three different high school golf teams. When it was announced at the beginning of the summer that the city of Bothell was acquiring this property from the Forterra Group, we reached out to the city to see what was in store for the future of this operation. Our golf associations, high school programs, and employees need to know what to expect in the upcoming years. We were assured that once the city took over this property, the golf operations would continue for the next two years while long range planning was conducted. To let the golf course just become open space was going to cost the city of Bothell approximately $200,000 a year in maintenance and it made more sense to keep golf operations running as normal. Now since the operating lease with the Richards family was expiring at the end of September, the city of Bothell posted an RFP for the management of the golf operation at the, and at the end of August I was given a verbal commitment on a contracted management proposal that could actually show a profit on an annual basis to the city. Part of this business plan did account for converting Wayne Golf Course at some point into a nine hole facility and using the back nine as open space for public use. But two weeks ago we were informed that the city of Bothell would not go through with the proposed management contract and instead will turn the property into open space. Now besides the tremendous cost to the city, you only need to look at what was once Wellington Hills and Lake Ballinger golf courses to see how unattractive this property will become when it's no longer maintained as a golf course. Many of our senior men and women, regular golfers, high school teams, and local juniors will now need to find a new golf home. This decision will make nearly a dozen people unemployed. All of this is a shame and makes no financial or common sense. After an 80 year history for that golf course, I would urge you to not allow the golf operations at Wayne Golf Course to end with just less than a month's notice. Thanks for your time. Thank you, next is, <laughs> next is Clark Heidegger. Sorry if I pronounced that wrong. Hello, I uh, want to thank the um, city and community for allowing me to speak and uh, my name is Clark Heidegger and I'm the uh, secretary of the Wayne Men's Club. Many are gathered here today. Um, I am one of the many people who learned to golf at Wayne. My father taught me to play 40 odd years ago at that course and that dynamic continues to see, uh, continues today as our pro just mentioned. Um, you see parents teaching children. It's a great course. It fills an important niche. It's for beginners, casual golfers, but it's also got a challenge for ex experienced golfers. It Golf in this sedentary world, it's really wonderful that it does promote an active lifestyle. And I'm reminded of Art Kane, one of our members. He played into his 90s. He was a World War II veteran, did the honor flight back to Washington, D.C. Even when he couldn't play, he continued to keep coming to social events at Wayne. And, you know, we lost him a year ago, but it was a home to him and a lot of players. The um, affordability is a huge factor. I'm very concerned that with the loss of Wayne, a lot of seniors on fixed incomes and lower income uh, uh, players are just not going to have a golfing home anymore. The, the, the other options are gone. Um, so that said, this is ultimately for the city a, um, 
a financial decision. It, 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 you know, you you need to weigh the cost of maintaining the front nine out of city money versus letting or having a, that those cuts off, offset by a golf operation. And so there's an additional economic consideration I, I want to bring up, and that is the positive effect that that course has on your local economy. Uh, you know, um, every day Wayne brings people to Bothell who otherwise wouldn't come here. Um, these are people who patronize local merchants. They spend money in your community. I ran the numbers on our um, membership, and 22% uh, have Bothell addresses. 78% of our membership are coming from somewhere else. And so that that's sizable. If you extrapolate that over the tens of thousands of rounds at Wayne every year, that is a lot of traffic coming into this community where they can spend money. Uh, and, you know, I mean, I can just anecdotally myself, my wife and I, you know, we go to the Anderson School to eat, we get our pet supplies at the Bothell Feed Center, and we won't be doing that if Wayne is gone. I, I live in Seattle. I come out here because of Wayne Golf Course. I stay out here in the community because of Wayne Golf Course. Um, so, you know, I just urge you to think about those sort of secondary financial issues in making this decision. That's what I have to say, and um, thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak to you. Next, is, thank you. Next is Steve Anderson. Good evening. We are in the city of Bothell, right? Not Bellevue. All right. Um, my name is Steve Anderson. My dad was a ball firefighter for 32 years. I was raised on the Wayne Golf Course uh, from learning to play golf to my first three jobs were at Wayne Golf Course. Uh, on the maintenance crew in the pro shop, uh, when I was seven years old, I'd go out and put a stake in the middle of the green on the, the weekend mornings and get the dew off the greens. Uh, I still play there. I live in the, on the west side of Shoreline. I still play there once or twice a week. With all, can, can everybody from Wing Golf Course stand up? <clears throat> okay. So, those of you that can see my shirt, I, I wore this today because this is an example of something that we lost and that we all miss. And so, kind of relates to Wing Golf Course. If we lose Wing Golf Course, we're gonna feel like the uh, Seattle Supersonics, right? We all want them back. Once we take some away from us, we can't get it. It's hard to get back. So let's uh, keep Wayne Golf Course going for at least two more years. Nine holes would be great. I played out there today. I played 36 holes with some of my comrades and uh, I really hope we can keep it going. I hope you guys listen and we can at least keep this going. I'm happy to volunteer hours, get some volunteer out maintenance crew, help out uh, however we can. So. Wayne has a great plan. I've talked to him a lot this summer, and I hope that uh, we can all work something out and make it happen. Thank you. Thank you. That's all the sign-up sheets I have. Would anybody else like to provide public comment? Okay, go ahead, come up and give your name for the record. Don't be scared. <laughs> we try to make it very safe. Hi, um, I'm Lynn Anderson, his mom. <laughs> um, I, we live along the Wayne Golf Course and by number five. And of course, we all would love to keep the course just because of the history for our family. Um, but a minimum, the front nine. Uh, my father-in-law, Harold Anderson, helped build the back nine along with my husband, Al Anderson. Um, and Steve grew up along the river, diving for golf balls and golfing with his dad all the time. So the golf course and the club and all the members at the club hold a great place in our hearts. But I know that our history there isn't all that important, but I think for Bothell it, it, it is. Um, uh, let's see. Um, I am thinking how great it would be if we could keep this nine hole course um, in the new Bothell plan, over the past three, three to four years in Bothell, we've seen a lot of change. It's become a destination place for people with McMinimans and the UW Bothell and all the new restaurants and Popkini Field and, and all the infrastructure going on. And I think it would just be wonderful if we could keep Wayne Golf Course as a part of this community. I think um, we need to figure out a way to keep the course and um, 
finding out that October 2nd, the course Make Flows, was kind of a big surprise to me. I know it was coming in the future, but not so soon. So um, I think many of us are willing and to be creative and to fight for this. And as Wayne or said, um, the importance of bringing families to the golf course, not just a, a golf course for a bunch of pro golfers and stuff, but the fact that it would be a small town family location. And if we could bring that back to Wayne Golf Course, I think that that would be very wonderful. It's a treasured part of our city. Thank you. Is there anybody else that would like to provide public comment? Go ahead and come up to the podium, give your name for the record. Hello, my name is Will Caldwell. I'm a frequent Wayne golfer. And uh, yeah, a lot of a lot of it's already been said, but I just wanted to come throw my own two cents in that I live in Edmonds, Washington, and come to Wayne at least once or twice a week. Like he said or she said, I spend money in Bothell, which uh, goes to the local community, and feel like there's creative options where we could keep this open and make it a financially viable asset for the city. Possibly even use people doing community service work to help maintain it. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else that, that would like to provide public comment? I got it that time. Seeing none, we will go into, uh, let's see. Ah, there it is, special presentation. So the Transportation Development Rights Landscape Conservation and Local Infrastructure Preservation. It's got a couple of big long acronyms there. <laughs> Murph, sorry I didn't call you back today. Tuesdays are a real bad day no to, to call people back. Uh, but we have uh, Michael Murphy from uh, the TDR program manager for King County. Mr. Mayor, while they're setting up, um, I'd like to uh, let those that are in the audience tonight know that um, on October 3rd, staff will be making a full presentation for council's consideration related to the Wayne Golf Course. Um, and the future of, of the operations of that. And so I encourage anyone to come back. That'll be where we lay out um, what proposal we received, um, what the financial investment would need to be for the city, um, what it would take to run that as a golf course and, and what the staff's recommendation is and why. And so I really encourage um, uh, participation on that evening as well if members are able to attend. And that was October 3rd? Correct. Okay. You ready, Murph? Mr. Mayor, I had just a question about the October 3rd meeting. So okay. is, is that where we'll see the city's request for proposal and all the proposals that were received? And Only one proposal was received, okay. yes, and that proposal will be attached, and staff will um, explain why it was considered not viable and um, non-responsive to the RFP um, and articulate all of that and then provide the information with relation to um, the substantial capital investments that would need to happen to make that a viable golf course owned by a city. Um, and, and provide you the cost for the maintenance um, as open space and, and what the plans are. Okay. Go ahead. Mr. Mayor, Deputy Mayor, Council Members, thanks for having me here tonight. Again, my name is Michael Murphy. I'm going to do some of the talking tonight, and um, Nick Bratton from Forterra is going to do more of the talking this evening. I'll, I have the first six or eight slides, and Nick's going to pick it up from there. Um, we're going to teach you some new acronyms, TDR and LCLIP, and talk about what those are. And this is really an information sharing program, hopefully leading to an opportunity for the city of Bothell to capture some revenue and bring transferable development rights into the city and revenue into the city to support infrastructure in the city. Um, stop me any time with questions. We'll have time at the end to have more discussion and, and more detailed questions, but if there's something you want clarity on during the show, go ahead and stop me and just and, uh, and ask in line, and same goes for Nick. So TDR, Transfer of Development Rights, and LCLIP, the Landscape Conservation and Local Infrastructure Program. This is a graphic from our friends at Forterra, um, which when I first saw this, it sort of turned my world around because it's looking from the north to the south, and normally maps are arranged otherwise. Um, 
and looking at our region with Snohomish County toward the bottom of the slide, King County in the middle, Pierce County at the top of the slide, and we see Mount Rainier up there. What this image shows, and Bothell I, I noticed is, is sort of the center of the universe in this image, so I thought you guys might like this. Um, what this image shows is the growth in the landscape today um, as it's built out right now. When we advance this, we look at what growth is if it's full build out. This is growth to zoning capacity throughout the region. A lot more gray in the region. Um, I'm gonna go back here and look at today and 2100 um, at full build out. And then the next slide is what if we focus the growth in the region into the urban areas. Um, so this is existing growth plus focused growth in the urban areas. I'm going to take a quick aside here and relate this conversation that we're having tonight about the transfer of development rights and the tool that this, um, the, the outcomes that this tool can provide with something bigger going on in the region in King County right now. As many of you are probably aware, King County Executive Dow Constantine has an initiative underway to look at what it would take to finish the job of conservation in King County. What are all of the forest lands, farmlands, river valleys that we want to see permanently protected across the King County so that the citizens of our county and our region in the future have the same benefits of an intact landscape as we have today. The transfer of development rights tool is a way to focus growth potential, moving growth potential from the rural areas and focusing it in the urban areas. It has an outstanding effect of pr protecting what we care about in King County and the region of forests and farms and places to hike um, and, and be with nature. So I just wanted to, to use these images to, to make the point that the transfer of development rights tool really is linked into a larger vision of conservation in the region and it's a way to make that happen on the ground. So, so looking at this, um, I'm going to move on now and talk a little bit the, the technicalities of how the transfer of development rights program works. Essentially it's a way, as I said before, to transfer unused growth potential from rural and resource areas, and by resource I mean f um, farmland zones and forest zones, if properties in the rural or resource zones aren't fully developed, there's development potential associated with them. If you think about a 20-acre parcel in an RA5 zone, one home per five acres, that could have four homes on it, that 20-acre parcel. If there's one home on that 20-acre parcel, there are three development rights that that owner could turn into a commodity. And this is what King County's Transfer of Development Rights Program does, is turn that unused development potential into a commodity that can be traded through space and time. So that rural landowner that owns a 20-acre lot that could have four homes but only has one would agree to having a conservation easement recorded on their property that would permanently protect the, um, or restrict any future growth on that property turn those three development rights into a commodity that could then be sold to urban developers who could get some bonus because of it, whether it's in increased density or um, different design elements. There's a, um, the aspect of moving that development potential into urban areas, focusing growth where there's infrastructure to support it. And that's really what this graphic shows, is that we protect, we preserve open space like a farm showing on the graphic. We move those development rights into urban areas where we add additional square feet to development projects or additional units to subdivisions, those developers who are doing that and getting that bonus are paying for it, and that money is funneled back to the landowner who originally participated in the program. So it's this revolving cycle. We've done this in King County to great effect. I have um, slides, just a few slides further on, that, that shows where and how this is played out in the landscape. Any questions on the basics of TDR here? Yes. Great, thank you. Um, so in your first slide, it looked as if the, um, the red lines show, showing borders City with boundaries. the GMA areas. Yes, yes. And as I understand it, the GMA is supposed to essentially provide for your third slide, 2100 or uh, that it limits the growth, and, and, and I get that you're, you're um, 
allowing the purchase of development rights in, in increasing. But so I, I guess I'm just having a horror, you know, if isn't GMA supposed to be doing this for us without having the extra cost to development? This, um, well, a couple things. This is voluntary. So you're right, GMA does have it within it the principles of protecting rural and resource areas and focusing growth in urban areas. This tool takes it a step further and says there are things in the rural areas that we really want to protect for the functions that they provide to us as a, as a society, working forests, working farms, open space in rural areas. This is voluntary, so we're not forcing anybody to do it, but, um, but you're right, this is based in GMA, and th that's what this slide here is about, which is um, a different look at the, at, the, at the county. The rural areas, this is where TDRs come from and move into the urban areas um, that are the receiving sites. So hopefully that gets to your question. It's, it's okay. above and beyond what GMA already provides. Right, Another question? You. I'm glad you have the the uh, next slide up about sending sites and receiving sites because if you live in a sending site area, this feels like a really good deal. But if you live in a receiving site area where you're already impacted by increased density and lack of infrastructure to serve it, um, it, it doesn't seem like such a good deal. Um, so what is your response to that? Nick is going to talk about that. Now okay. I'm not. I'm not copping out. Um, okay. That's I what the that's what the landscape conservation and local infrastructure program is all about. Is making this work for cities so that there is additional money, and that's what we're talking about at the end of the day. When Nick gets up, we'll start. We'll start talking about what it, what is in it for the city. Um, we recognize that adding density in cities comes along with additional needs. And Forterra, formerly the Cascade Land Conservancy, crafted this mechanism to um, essentially allow the city, I'm sorry, I'm going to steal a little bit of your thunder here, but essentially allow the city to capture a portion of the county's property tax revenues that accrue with new development in the city. Nick will explain a lot more about that, but what's in it for the city and what's in it for the receiving areas under this landscape conservation and local infrastructure model is money. Uh, to support infrastructure that will support that higher density development. So we'll, we'll dive into that a lot deeper when Nick gets up here. And so what about an underutilized parcel in an urban area like the Wayne Golf Course Don't Leave? Um, so this is sort of a topic in, in relation to Wayne Golf Course. If people want to preserve functions there, so what about how, how would such a, a, um, a TDR work for, uh, like I said, a, a, an underutilized parcel in an urban area? Because you're, we're talking globally, you know, sending development from way off in rural East King County and sending that development potential here. Can we, can we do it so that we can preserve land, preserve functions of our our own urban undeveloped property? It's a great question. Some cities, um, Redmond included, have an internal um, TDR program that operates within the city. King County's program and this regional program that we're talking about move the development potential from rural and resource areas in unincorporated King County into cities. One of the ideas, and I wasn't planning to dive down into this level at this point, but but I will, since you asked the question, which is a good one. One of the ideas that we're contemplating is the county has expertise of running a transferable development rights program. Could the county serve as a service provider in a program that allowed development rights to transfer from properties within cities that were underdeveloped, as well as from properties in unincorporated King County where there were development rights to give? In other words, sending sites could be in unincorporated rural King County that would trigger this LCLIP revenue share that Nick will talk more about. And there could also be an opportunity to have sending sites from within the city should council choose to pass legislation adopting such a program. And King County would be in a position, so long as we could cover our administrative costs, to administer both of those programs so that for the developers in the city, it would be a seamless transaction that um, they weren't messing around trying to figure out where their where their credits were coming from and so forth. So, 
get to your question. Yeah, and okay. then one last question. Sure. Is the county going to stop upzoning um, properties in the rural areas? Because as you upzone those properties, you create more unused growth potential that can then get transferred to the urban areas. So it seems like you wouldn't want to do both. The I'm not familiar with many up zones in the rural area that have happened. I'm not saying they haven't happened. I'm just not familiar with them. So I'd want to see the specific cases where that happened. In some cases, there are up zones that occur under what's called a four to one program, where four times the, the area that's up zoned is protected in the immediate vicinity that um, essentially fortifies the growth line there. Um, generally speaking, and again, there may be specifics I'm unaware of, but generally speaking, the county has done a very good job of holding the growth line in place and maintaining of the rural zoning, especially in the forest and agricultural zones, but also in the rural residential zones. Um, Thank to you. My knowledge. Thank you. Um, I've just got a couple more slides, and then I'll let Nick go here. Um, the this is a map of King County's sending sites and receiving sites, um, life to date. The green dots are areas that have transferred development rights and, and from, away from them, they're the sending sites, and the orange dots are the areas that have received development rights. You can see that some of those orange dots are actually in the rural area. There is a provision in King County's TDR code that allows accessory dwelling units an additional square footage allotment uh, in the rural area. So by code, accessory dwelling units are limited to 1,000 square feet using transferable development rights, they're allowed to go to 1,500 square feet in the rural area. So that's why there are some sending, or some receiving sites rather in the rural areas. The darkest green on this map are the, um, the areas that have been protected by the transferable development rights um, program. It's, we're at 145,000 acres and counting of per permanent landscape protection across King County. These, this is the sort of war map showing the flow between the sending sites and the receiving sites throughout the county. And then just a, a few quick stats. We've got, as I said, about 145,000 acres permanently protected, forest land, farmland, river valleys, rural open space in, in the rural residential areas. We've issued either to the bank or the King County TDR bank where the county owns them or to private owners about 2,500 TDRs. We've sold more than 800 of them, many of those into the city of Seattle, downtown, South Lake Union, Denny Triangle. We've got an additional 400 under contract um, and about 100 separate transactions. All of our data is online in a, in a pretty easy to follow way. And um, this tool is working very well for King County, both in terms of focusing growth in urban areas and also bringing revenue for protection of the landscape. So I'm going to stop at this point and let Nick come up and Take the microphone. Uh, Murph, thanks for that great introduction. Again, Nick Bratton, Policy Director with Forterra. Um, to pick up the storyline here, um, this is really about cities and quality of life and how do we grow as a region in a way that really retains the quality of life and the, the landscapes that define the character and the economy of this region. People move here because this is a beautiful area. How do we keep this area beautiful? Um, and retain that integrity of the landscape as we continue to grow. Um, great question earlier about the impacts of growth in cities. Uh, this is something that we've really placed at the forefront of our work uh, for Terra is how to roll in the design or updates of uh, TDR programs for eight different cities, four different counties, and this regional program I'm going to give an overview of. So um, this is something that we're deeply invested in as an organization to see succeed and it's been great to partner with uh, King County who's been um, equally invested in the in the success of this approach so um, a little bit more detail about the LCLIP program uh, this really originated through conversations with cities we had been working with several cities around the region in the pursuit of this uh, approach of TDR, and what we heard from a lot of communities was, this is great, we get it, we see the public benefit of the conservation piece, but we're having a hard time delivering services and providing infrastructure for the growth that we have. And if we're going to see more people coming through this program, we really need more tools to address that and pay for the growth and support what we have. Um, so that really drove the, 
the genesis of LCLIP. Um, and so the layout here that I just want to draw attention to is that uh, this, this regional program, LCLIP, is limited to 35 cities around the region. Uh, these are the 35 largest cities, um, and this represents about three quarters of all the growth that we'll see in the central Puget Sound over the next 20 years. So we wanted to just focus this on where is the growth coming and how can we harness that driver to help concentrate uh, where the infrastructure investment needs to go and how to drive conservation. Uh, by contrast, the areas here that we've highlighted for potential conservation are all the red dots that you see here. Uh, Murph already showed a great piece on how much King County has already successfully protected. Um, if we look at the total universe of what's out there in the three county region, uh, there's over a half million acres of farm and forest um, that could potentially still be converted for residential development. Uh, so that's the kind of the, the uh, the blue sky target there of what are, what what could we potentially conserve as a region through this tool? Uh, so those 650,000 acres of rural and farm and forest lands uh, represent about 24,000 development rights or the number of homes that could be built um, in these rural areas. Why would a city need to pursue this program or be interested? Um, we already talked about the need for providing infrastructure. But public improvements that cities want to invest in are expensive. Sidewalks, streetscapes, utilities, bridges, um, these, these come with a price tag and it's becoming increasingly difficult for cities to find funding for these. It's, uh, uh, grant programs, federal and state support are complicated, they're competitive, and they're, their certainty um, is, is not clear. So uh, we wanted to create a tool that would give cities certainty and flexibility and kind of some self-direction in how they added to that picture of, of paying for infrastructure improvements. So that's what, what LCLIP is really aimed to do, is to create a, a financial incentive for cities to grow using TDR. Uh, so we designed state legislation that was signed into law in 2011. Uh, this is Governor Gregoire um, uh, signing the actual bill. and. What this program does is it combines TDR, as Murph described, with a form of tax increment financing um, under Washington State Constitution. Uh, straight up TIF is not allowed, uh, but this legislation um, works because it combines these two concepts uh, in a way that is kind of a scaled down version of tax increment financing, and I'll, I'll illustrate what that looks like. Uh, so. If a city chose to use this tool, um, they would identify some geography, some district within the city where they wanted to make infrastructure investments and where they wanted to encourage growth. And uh, at the start of the program, they would take a snapshot of the assessed value in that area. And over time, as new growth comes in, there's new construction, new projects, uh, the assessed value of that area increases as a result of, of the growth. Uh, the city gets to keep uh, a portion of the incremental tax value of that new growth that would otherwise go to the county. Uh, and this revenue stream uh, continues for up to 25 years. So this is uh, a new source of funding uh, that is otherwise not accessible to cities. So this is something that can add to a city's existing funding strategy for capital facilities. Another way to look at this, which uh, I think uh, makes a little bit more sense. Um, if you look at the distribution of property tax revenues for any single property, where does this go? Um, state law dictates how that is distributed, and this is roughly the breakdown for how that works. Um, that would be a snapshot of any given property today, um, or a neighborhood, or the city. As the city grows, uh, this revenue pie gets bigger as a result of new construction coming. And on the left, we have an example of that pie getting bigger and each individual slice getting proportionally larger with it uh, as a result of the new property tax generated. Uh, if a city uses LCLIP, you can see here on the, the right-hand side, a portion of the revenue that would otherwise go to the county, the city gets to keep if they participate in this program and 
choose to use transfer of development rights. Uh, a county gets to retain a portion of it as well, um, but the idea is here is uh, a transfer of revenue from the county to the city as an incentive for cities to protect resource lands that benefit the county. Any questions here? Yes, sir. We used uh, LIPT to do our 522 realignment, but that was a state lift. There's a county lift also? Uh, this is a different program from lift. I believe lift is derived from sales tax revenue, and this has to deal with property tax revenue. So it's another version of it that's at the county level. It's a different version that involves the city retaining a portion of the county share of the property tax from new construction. The good news is that this program can be stacked on top of lift. They're not mutually exclusive. So a city can have a lift program in place and use this as a supplement to that. Um, it's not an either or choice. The city can, can choose to use both. Does that answer your question? Sure. And then in one of your earlier slides where you showed, um, it was the map with all the red dots about how do you determine what areas get uh, qualify for being, um, you know, the transfer development for to get the money to buy to purchase the development rights. Uh, which lands are conserved? Yeah. Uh, so that was part of the the, the legislative process. Um, one of the goals under the program is to really focus on conservation of those resource lands of GMA long-term commercial significance. So for the most part, those properties you saw in the rural areas are working farms and forests. Um, that people are making a living off of. It's not a five-acre hobby farm. These are farms that are people's livelihoods. So um, what about other government-owned properties that are within the GMA? Uh, so the only eligible sending areas, uh, lands that can sell their development rights, are privately owned. Uh, lands that are in public ownership are already considered protected. Um, I believe there may be... Murph, does King County have an exclusion for DNR surplus yeah, land? Right. Okay. Land. Yeah, so for state trust lands that are on the list to be surplused that could potentially enter private ownership, those are eligible as well. But for the most part, the intent of this program is let's protect those private lands that are at risk for conversion to residential development. And so public the, lands don't the, meet the those. The two DNR areas. parcels that we have in the Snohomish County portion of the city, would they qualify? Because they're up for... They're going to be up for sale. If they are within the city boundary, then probably not. Okay, so the, there's no way for us, for in the city to save open space using this program. Um, I believe the GMA allows for um, that provision if the city has a TDR program. So that's a fairly esoteric and detailed question. Um, I like the direction you're going with it. Um, to really do it justice, I would probably have to do a little bit more homework to figure out the details of what would be involved there. So uh, I can't definitively say no, that's off the table, um, but that's just not a provision that I'm familiar with off the top of my head right now. So and You're making, uh, as you're going on, it's come across as this is a King County deal only, not a Snohomish County. Uh, that's incorrect. The, um, the geographic extent of Elklip is the three county region of King Pierce and Snohomish. Okay. So the original intent of the of the program is let's create a regional marketplace, um, kind of like the European Union of development rights where you can have free movement of credits across counties. Uh, a developer in Tacoma can purchase a development right from a farmer in Snohomish County. Uh, let's increase the supply, let's increase the demand, and uh, really create a bigger market to increase activity for conservation and and for growth. All right, thank you. Certainly. So I have, a, I have a quick question for staff. Director Shackman's not here, but um, it's from what I understand, when a new development happens and the new assessed value, it's not that the city just gets to tax that new assessed value. I thought it, uh, property taxes that the city gets to collect is 1% more than the prior year, regardless of the new development. Is that inaccurate or is that? I don't know. We didn't. I'm not familiar enough, so we'd have to wait for her to return. Is she here? Uh, she, <laughs> she was. She was here? Okay. 
Um, yeah, because I'm just curious, because um, there's, I mean, I guess in this, we struggle with this, that's why I bring it up, not that I appreciate your presentation and everything, it's just that people see development go up and they think the city's just raking in a whole bunch more money for property taxes per year, and it's not the case, is what I understand, so I just kind of wanted to get that clarified. So maybe she'll come later, but go ahead and- Yeah, we can going. revisit that. Oh, sorry, you got one more question up here. Oh, yes. So the 75% number could be an enticing number, but do you have examples of what that uh, turns out to be in actual dollars? Yes, we'll get to that shortly. Okay, thank you. Uh, so what specifically are the opportunities here in Bothell to use this program? Uh, a few years ago, the city hired a an economic consultant uh, to do a feasibility analysis of how the tool could be used here. This was done by Community Attributes, and they looked at um, a few different ways the city could use the tool. Um, they looked at growth in the downtown area and in the North Creek sub area as the potential neighborhoods that could benefit from using this program and uh, identified some opportunities for how uh, the private market could drive the use of transfer of development rights. Um, the best opportunities appear to be through incentive zoning. Um, in addition to that, um, we've looked in other cities at using TDR to access a multifamily tax exemption. Uh, developer agreements are another possibility as well. Um, so the, uh, the result of the study in Bothell was that uh, just in the King County portion of the city, if uh, the North Creek sub area and downtown were, were enrolled in this program, uh, the extent of the revenue that could be generated was up to $3 million over the course of 25 years. Um, as a supplement to that original study, um, the consultant looked at expanding the program to the Snohomish County side of the city. So uh, there's more growth opportunity happening there. They looked at the Canyon Park neighborhood and estimated that if the city uh, were to implement the program on both sides of the border and uh, include as much geography as possible in the program, um, that would increase the revenue estimate to over $7 million over the life of the program. So. Yes. So were you talking about transferring development into the North Creek area or into downtown or into Canyon Park? That's right. The, those three areas would be the potential receiving sites that the consultant examined as a possible scenario for using this program. Which is ironic because we all appreciate preserved open space and this city has devoted years of effort towards preserving open space in the North Creek area. Um, because in our picture, in our small world, you know, we have our watershed of North Creek to protect. And yet we're, I mean, I know you're just talking about an example, but this vision of creating green space every place else so we can pave over the interior, I don't, I don't know, I just, ha I, tr I have trouble with that because we have watersheds with um, viable creeks and streams and rivers right here in our own backyard. So I I'm really interested in how we protect, protect what's in our own backyard. I mean, uh, Council Member Spivey's talking about private land that's in Snohomish County. Um, Wayne Golf Course is private land, it's now owned by Forterra. Um, you know, we're, I'm thinking about how do we preserve those, those open space jewels that are right here in our midst. Uh, to address both those points with the North Creek scenario, um, what the consultant looked at there was a commercial park that was already developed and considered that underutilized space that could be redeveloped. So this scenario did not entail any paving over of existing open space. It's just redevelopment of existing development. So how can, uh, where are the opportunities to more efficiently use existing underutilized developed property? So there is no suggestion at all of conversion of open space within the city for development purposes. Uh, secondly, um, to address the interest in protecting uh, lands within the city, absolutely that can happen. Uh, the city of Redmond does that. Uh, the city of Seattle has an in-city open space provision. City of Tacoma does as well. That certainly 
uh, a, a valid way to approach using this tool. The trade-off is that if you focus the conservation on in-city areas, it doesn't satisfy the requirements of the uh, state-level program, and there's no revenue benefit as a result. I mean, you can be more selective about protecting open space within the city, and that's certainly, you know, several cities have taken that approach, um, but the trade-off is you don't get any money. Um, so that's something to think about in, uh, in any implementation of this tool. I had a quick question. Um, I'm, I'm not quite understanding how the multifamily tax, tax exemption works with the TDR placement. Sure. So there, right now there are two flavors of the multifamily tax exemption. There's a 12-year uh, that's awarded for projects that are uh, involve affordable housing, and there's an eight-year um, which can be some kind of public benefit. It doesn't have to be affordable housing. It can be other things. And so what we've explored in other cities such as Tequila and Shoreline uh, that are also looking at using this tool is can developers acquire development rights as a means to access the eight-year tax exemption. So, for example, if a project would save half a million dollars over eight years by using that program, would they be willing to spend some money to achieve that savings? And we've seen opportunities for this to work in other cities, so we just wanted to include that as an example here for creative ways for uh, capturing demand for growth in the private market in a way that adds value to a project um, that can drive the use of TDR. Does that answer your question? Great. Thank you. Um, so to move along here, the bottom line is that there there is revenue available here through this program uh, to the city of Bothell, but recognizing that the findings of this economic study are several years old now, so the relevance may have shifted. There may be, um, you know, that potential value may have changed now. So I think given the um, changes in the real estate market in the region, that might be something that is worth revisiting. So we'll, we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, to touch on who else is using this program, uh, Seattle is currently the only one of the 35 eligible cities that has adopted the tool and is using it. Um, it's working very well there. Uh, there are several other cities around the region that are also in different stages of pursuing implementation uh, from Tacoma in the south to Mount Lake Terrace in the north um, and several other cities in between. So um, this, is, uh, this is not uncharted waters. This is something that has taken hold and has caught the interest of several other communities around the region. So the ingredients for using um, Elk Clip here in, uh, in Bothell, and this really applies to any city for that matter, is to really tap into the private market and the demand for growth to drive the program. Uh, the idea here is really achieve conservation and drive revenue for the city without spending tax dollars. So um, any kind of incentive-based approach that um, developers and landowners can find each other and achieve the conservation and achieve the growth um, is the best bet for getting the most value out of this program. Um, secondly is the timing. Uh, this program only runs for 25 years, so it's to nobody's advantage to launch the program and then just kind of wait for growth to come in. Uh, timing the start of the program with a known project that will kind of kickstart the program um, is probably the most, most effective way to do that to maximize the, the, the revenue benefit and to achieve the conservation goals of the program. Um, partnering with counties is is really important part of this. Uh, King County takes a very um, engaged approach to partnering with cities and they have interlocal agreements with I believe five cities in King County um, to just set expectations around the roles and responsibilities and obligations of the county and the city in how this relationship works. Um, so that is uh, always going to be a part of that arrangement um, in partnering with King County. Snohomish County takes a little more hands-off approach. Um, they really want to see the benefits of this program, but they're not as involved in kind of the day-to-day -day management of it in the way that King County is. Um, and there are also some TDR placement milestones as a provision for continuing the flow of revenue to cities. So um, in the design of this program, when we were 
including counties and cities in the conversation, um, counties expressed concern that we don't want to just be writing checks to cities without seeing the, the commensurate conservation happening as a result. So we included this provision um, that we'll get to in, I guess, just a second, getting a little bit ahead of the, the presentation here. Um, but cities also want to know uh, what, what's at stake here? What could, what could go wrong? What are the potential costs of using this program if it doesn't go according to plan? Anything looking into the future in terms of growth and revenue is a difficult crystal ball to read. Um, so how can we mitigate those risks? So the first thing to make, to be clear on, is that there's no, there's no financial penalty uh, for missing any of the milestones in the program. Uh, the city will collect revenue over time. If it doesn't meet its obligations, the county can just stop the revenue flow. The city gets to keep any money it's already collected, so there's no return of earned revenue. There's no financial penalty for withdrawing or ending the program. So there really is no, no, no consequence of that nature. The city gets to keep all the money that uh, the growth generates. Um, the biggest risk is missing out on what could have been gained. The majority of the revenue comes in the later years of the program. It kind of ramps up over time. Um, so the biggest risk is for cities that withdraw or end the program early is they just don't get to collect the revenue uh, when it's really going to be coming in thick and fast at the end. So we'll, we'll take a quick look at what that involves. Um, over the first 10 years of the program, uh, the city needs to bring in half of the credits that it commits to. Um, so the city has 10 years to get halfway there, um, and at which point, um, if this milestone is not met, the counties can say, all right, you're not, you guys aren't holding up your end of the bargain. Um, we're pulling the plug. No more revenue sharing for you. Um, but if the city does achieve this goal, then that extends the program for another five years. The city gets to collect some more revenue, um, but also within the next five years needs to place another portion of the credits that it is committed to. And then likewise until year 20, at which point all the credits need to be placed um, preferably through the private market. And at this point, having achieved this, the city then gets to collect revenue for another five years. Um, so this is, this is really kind of the, that, that tail end bonus that I alluded to. This is where most of the benefit is, comes from. So there is a pretty powerful incentive to stick with the program and, and make sure that it is um, that it's working. Uh, so the uh, main points here, again, this is a new source of infrastructure, infrastructure financing to cities uh, that would not otherwise be available. And this supports uh, infill development. Um, this is all through the private market. So uh, you're not changing the tax burden on anyone. You're just redirecting um, to which level of government that existing tax base goes. Um, and this also reduces development pressure in rural areas that we want to keep intact uh, for their um, uh, economic benefits, for their environmental benefits, for their character of the region. Um, and this is also good for the county. If there is less growth going out into the rural areas, the county is not paying for roads, the county is not providing services to that growth. So they're actually saving money um, by having cities use this tool. And then finally, um, I do want to emphasize that this program is not a driver of growth. It just taps into growth that is already happening and creates a public benefit both to cities through the revenue sharing and to the counties through the conservation piece. And with that, uh, we just wanted to throw out some potential next steps uh, for council consideration. Um, one possible course of action having heard all this information is recognizing that the uh, the revenue scenarios that were calculated are now several years old. The real estate market has changed, the growth prospects have changed. Um, updating those would create or would provide a more accurate reflection of what the revenue benefit might be for the city. So that's one, one potential course of action. Um, another would be to uh, partner with the counties, King County and Snohomish County, and with Forterra to look into more detail of what are the specific steps involved, what 
what's entailed, what would we have to do in order to put this into place. Um, and one one way for achieving that might be through council motion. So those are just a range of potential next steps, um, entirely up to the city's discretion for uh, where the interest is, um, but just wanted to lay those out there as a range of potential actions. And um, at that point, I'll invite Murph up and collectively we can hopefully field any additional questions that you may have. Okay, um, the finance director is here now, so I wanted to um, hopefully have her explain the how tax property tax works. So when we have new development come into the city, um, the assessed value obviously of that land is increased, but it's not a direct proportional increase to the tax revenues to the city, I think. So that's why I wanted to hand it off to her. What I understand is we only can collect 1% more tax property tax than we did the prior year. So even if we have, I don't know, let's exaggerate, $50 million or more assessed value, from what I understand, it kind of doesn't matter because you only get 1% more than you collected the prior year, but I'll hand it off because I'm sure I have it wrong. The way that it works is that we get 1%, uh, we can levy 1% of what we love or 101 percent of what we levied the prior year but new construction gets added to the tax roll so that is in addition to the one percent um, but of course they're just that their portion that is added to the tax roll just covers the services that we're providing we still have to we have to show up to more police calls and fire calls and all the other services that we provide to um, entities in our city so I had it totally wrong. So new development actually is new. I just corrected it. <laughs> is increased uh, revenues. Okay, thanks. Councilman Sandberg. Can you go back to the program milestones graph? It's the last thing you showed. Just so I understand this. So a credit is, one credit is one residential unit? So what one credit represents is the right to build one home on a property in the rural area. What that converts to when it travels into an urban receiving area is pretty flexible. Um, each city has the discretion to define what they want to convert that into. Markets vary widely even within this region. Um, in some cities, uh, in Redmond for example, the bonus is for a commercial floor area. Um, in other cities, it's for building height, or it can be for additional dwelling units. Um, it can be also be used for, I mean, anything that adds value to a project can be the conversion item that the credit translates into. So that is totally flexible, um, and the, any city that uses this program can define what they want that to be, depending on what the market is, what the need is for. Um, in terms of these milestones, um, each city, when it signs on to the using this program, has to make a decision of how many credits do we want to bring into the city. And uh, there is a, there's a range, the Puget Sound Regional Council has assigned, basically allocated um, numbers of those credits to each eligible city, roughly based on growth targets. So for example, um, this won't be surprising that Seattle has the most, of about 3,400 of these credits and Bothell's is about a tenth of that, 365. Um, Mount Lake Terrace is 92, Tacoma is 1800. So the, the numbers of credits that different cities can choose to accept um, vary in proportion to the amount of growth that they're projected to, to, to see. Um, within that number, it's not an all or nothing proposition. A city, in order to start collecting revenue, has to commit to bringing in at least 20% of the credits that the that they've been allocated. So whatever 20% is of 36, uh, 365, um, would be the minimum to get Bothell going in this program. Um, it could take up to 365, and the way the program is designed, it encourages cities to participate at a higher level. The more credits you agree to bring in, the more revenue you get to collect. Um, and so if, uh, just to make the math simple, let's say a city commits to bringing in 200 credits, um, either by the private market or through their own purchase, they'd need to place 100 of those within the first 10 years. And by doing so, that keeps the faucet flowing of revenue from the counties. Um, and again, another quarter of those have to come in within the next five years, 
and then five years after that. So this gives the county some accountability and some recourse uh, and some level of assurance that cities are actually um, implementing the and achieving the conservation piece and they're not just collecting the revenue from the growth. This allows, this gives the county some security that some conservation is happening in conjunction with the growth. Does that answer your question? Yes, uh, but um, are the cities allowed to define whatever that credit is? Like, could we as a city define um, a, uh, a rural one residential unit equivalent to one urban residential unit? So that if we showed, for example, that we built, you know, the 50% the of 200, the 100 residential units, 100 additional units, um, we would we would show um, progress on our milestones or there there must be some requirement that says what we can define that credit as uh, actually not it's it's pretty wide open um, so the city can define that as whatever it wants the main thing is is that that development potential is being removed from the farms and from the forests the program doesn't really speak to what happens to it once it comes into the city you can do whatever you want with it you can just buy them and stick them in a drawer somewhere and not do anything with them. As long as they're purchased, either through the private market or by the city, um, the city has complete discretion as to what that translates into when it crosses the line. The main thing is that that unbuilt home is being removed from the farm or from the forest, and that's what gets you progress towards your goal. In terms of what you translate that into, it's really important in the program design to understand the dynamics in the marketplace because if you say, to stick with your example, if you awarded one additional um, dwelling unit within the city of Bothell in exchange for one development right purchased from a farm, um, that's probably not going to pencil for developers. That's going to be too expensive for them to use. So maybe you can um, change that ratio and say, well, you get four additional units uh, that you can build in your project, in your multifamily project, in exchange for bringing in one credit. Um, and that's profitable. So the relationship needs to work for the developers. Uh, it needs to be financially viable from their perspective. Otherwise, they're not going to choose to use it. And this is a voluntary program. So if they're not going to make some kind of return on it, they're not going to participate. So uh, what that translation is, is really best defined in conjunction with the information you would get from some understanding of the market study. Um, that was conducted as part of that um, feasibility analysis done by community attributes. Um, they have pages of tables that sh project, you know, one development right would be, uh, could translate into 1,600 square feet of floor space in a multifamily development um, at the time of the study. So that, again, that may have, you know, sh shifted a little. But uh, that analysis has been done, and there's a whole range of scenarios of um, how the city could translate those credits into uh, meaningful, usable commodities for developers in a way that would be attractive for them to use. I'll, Thank you. I'll tack on here just real quick that for this to work, and, and we've proven with Seattle that it can, it needs to work for all three entities involved, the counties being one. We need to get enough revenue up front for conservation. The, the revenue we would get from the sale of TDRs in the early years of an agreement like this has a lot more buying power than than if we metered that out over a longer period of time. So this allows us to accelerate the conservation and get more bang for our buck there. So the counties need to get enough revenue from an agreement like this, enough TDRs placed into the city and enough enough cash for each of the TDRs to for it to balance out because we're sharing the revenue on the other side. It needs to work for the city. There needs to be enough revenue to support infrastructure um, in the in the growth areas within the city for the city to say yes this is a good deal for us and then Nick made the point well it has to work for the developers if it doesn't pencil if the developers aren't improving their bottom line through the use of these transferable development rights they're not going to do it it's a vol there's um, it's a voluntary program so it's got to it's got to work for all three parties involved but with the Seattle agreement we're proving that 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 can happen and as we look at these uh, various analyses that we're doing for cities, we can see ways that it will work. It's complex, no doubt, but um, but we can we can get there if we if we think it through. Council Member, Mc Council Member McNeil, thank you and thank you for your presentation. 
So um, what is the time frame for doing a study like this, a new, to, to put in process a new study? Uh, so for um, starting from scratch, if a, you know, let's say um, Edmonds were to look at this tool, they, they have no prior track record of, of pursuing this to start from scratch to ending with um, findings and recommendations and kind of the here's the whole implementation process served on a silver platter uh, would probably take uh, a year to a year and a half. But the fact that uh, Bothell has already been through this process once and has an existing study um, that can be updated and built on, I would say there would be a relatively shorter time frame uh, just for kind of updating the real estate market dynamics, revisiting the assumptions that went into it, looking at you know the track record of growth in the last few years. Um, that could probably be done in relatively short order within you know, a couple of months. And is there a f cost associated with that study, or is that something that the county would do on our behalf? Or uh, I won't speak for the county uh, in terms of who's paying for it, but um, any consultant that would update that study would, would need their time and materials covered. So, yeah, there would be a, a modest cost associated with that. And the, the, the county has money that we could contribute to that. Of course, we'd like to have the city have some skin in the game and contribute as well. But, um, but we've, we've got money available to work on studies like this. I, I, you know, I'm not going to give you a number right now, but there's, there's money that we could bring to, the, bring to the equation. And we may be able to um, ask our partners at Forterra to contribute some, and we'd look for some from the city as well. I believe that's the way it happened last time. So um, that the, I, I think last time it may have been a cost share straight between the county and the city, or um, I know the county contributed a, a fair bit last time for this study, though. And so it was just a study. Nothing, nothing ever came of that study. Um, nope. It, it, um, the, the study last time. No, it just, it did not go anywhere last time. It didn't feel like it was quite ripe for for the picking. I think that the real the real estate market and the dynamics may have changed. The the numbers may have changed. I think it's worth, um, personally, I feel like it's worth taking another look at that to see how things have changed in the in the meantime. I think we're seeing growth and real estate appreciation um, much, you know, in a much stronger way than we were when that study was done before, which I believe was 2012 time frame. Yeah, to give an actual example of other cities that have been through this exact process, Met Lake Terrace had a uh, feasibility analysis done in 2014 uh, that projected $4 million in revenue for the city. Uh, that wasn't really enough to get anybody excited. Uh, but since then, um, a developer has put forward proposals for several projects um, that, if they were built, um, would be hundreds of millions of dollars in additional assessed value to the city. Um, that additional information, which you know hadn't even been imagined yet, um, at the time of the original study, really changed the outcome of the revenue projection. So um, the consultant that did that projection for Mount Lake Terrace repeated that with the new information about the proposed developments and found that would be $10 million in revenue. So that really changed the outcome for the city of Mount Lake Terrace. And granted, your mileage may vary depending on what what's going on locally, um, but um, there, there may be some value in revisiting that because Knowing what's happening now, things have changed in a few years, and you know, the the picture could be rosier, it could be worse, but you won't really know unless look, you look at it. Nick, quick question: Can you give us a ballpark for what some of the recent studies have um, have cost for the consultant time, and and think about that in in the terms of um, having the study that we already have updated? What might I, I'm I've got a number in my head, but I don't want to say it because he's he's been closer to some of these more recent studies than I have, so. Yeah, the, the study updates, um, we typically partner with a, a, a different economic research consultancy than community attributes, so I can't speak to them updating it. Um, and if the partner that we typically work with were to perform an update for the city of Bothell, I don't know, um, you know, I can't really speak to that. But for the Mount Lake Terrace update, it was, I think, under $10,000 to uh, to perform that, that update. It may have been well under that. So that was the total cost? Uh, for the for the update, yeah, for the uh, the revenue projections, I think it was actually closer to five or six thousand. Okay. And the number, just for reference, that was in my head was about twenty total. Uh, you know, all in to get this update. And I think that hearing what you've just said, I think that might be high. I think we could do it for less than that. And the county would be willing to um, take the lead in terms of contracting and so forth. 
certainly in partnership with the city to the extent that um, that you wanted to, but but we could play a contract manager manager role and so forth. Okay, and then I'm um, I'm really curious the jump from the original study um, in the downtown North Creek area to the Canyon Park area seemed like it jumped immensely, like from I think it was mentioned three million to seven million or something. Yeah, those are ballpark figures of what what was projected. Um, the reason being for that change is that on the King County side of the city, that was the area included in the original analysis, a lot of growth had already happened. Um, the, the driver of revenue is future growth in this program. So there was less opportunity for new growth in the King County portion of the city. There still was some to the tune of you know, potentially $3 million. Um, but the, on the Snohomish County side, uh, there's much greater opportunity for new growth, and that is what accounts for the additional potential revenue. When you look at the city in its entirety, um, some of that revenue would come from Snohomish County, some from King. So should this be, should we be looking at this as part of our regional growth center as well? Um, this program works best when paired with growth. So if you have areas in the city that you think have a lot of potential for uh, accommodating additional growth, then absolutely they should be considered for including in this program. The, one of the elements that we didn't dive into too deeply is that the revenue share occurs within a defined district, and that defined district can account for up to 25 percent, correct, of the city's assessed value. So you draw boundaries around areas that you want uh, to focus new growth, and those can account for up to 25 percent of the city's total assessed value. It's complicated in Bothell because you straddle the county line and you have potentially an area in Snohomish County and, an, and an, another area in King County and each respective county would share revenue into those two areas but um, the, the it, it occurs within a certain district so there's discretion the city has discretion with respect to where that defined district is so they'd be collaborating with both we'd be collaborating with both counties is what I think I hear you saying that's yeah, right. for, for maximum benefit under the program, um, both counties would be involved. Some would come from Snohomish, some from King. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any more questions, uh, Dep Deputy Mayor? Just a clarification. So the, the cost, is that for one county, the 10000 or whatever it would be? So is it actually, in fact, double? Uh, the cost of updating the study would be all-inclusive okay. for the entire expanse of the study. Don't quote us on that cost. We can get some real numbers. <laughs> no, I understand. <laughs> and I assume you're yeah. not paying for Snohomish County portions <laughs> of the study. Any other questions? <laughs> Councilmember Fried. Great. I, I thank you guys for your very thought-provoking, visionary presentation. I think it caused a lot of thoughts up here of what we can do as a city. Since last year, property values have increased by 14.1% or at least new sales of homes, right? And now resale homes are certainly increasing because builders just can't keep up with the demand. We've had over 45,000 jobs added each year for the last three years in our MSA, which is King County and Snohomish County. That doesn't count Pierce and other places within our region. Um, and we're gonna see further expansion even on the other side of the water as new passenger ferries have started. Um, permits, I think, for Multifamily in the MSA, I'm talking about in King and Snohomish is 14,500. For single family homes, it's 6,500. Growth is coming because over the next three years, we're projecting around 40,000 jobs per year just in that MSA. So I think this is the right time to be having that conversation. Like you say, property values have increased. Uh, we're seeing people wanting to come here. Amazon alone has 8,000 job postings out right now, and these are new jobs. So we're gonna be having people move to this region. I think if we have 40,000 jobs that are introduced in to our current MSA, it's something like 30,000 homes are needed, and there's no way that we can keep up with that. Uh, but yet, my concern is that growth is, or sorry, sprawl is going to occur. That's why I've always been a big fan of greater density. That's why downtown Bothell right now has a lot of density. There's people that were on council here, and then you've seen that density in Kirkland and Redmond and other places because it's important for us to consider that we need to have density. So when you talk about TDR, I was a benefit of this. I wasn't actually didn't benefit, but I developed a property in Redmond, 15 acres, seven acres we developed with 61 units. The other seven acres, the 
the gentleman who sold the property to me, he sold his TDRs, I think 35 of them, for another development in downtown Redmond. It made a lot of sense because it preserves seven green acres within the city. So I think we need to consider a TDR program within the city of Bothell. Um, but certainly this program where that would allow TDRs to be purchased, even if we have a 65 foot height limit for our buildings in certain areas in downtown Bothell, we can buy land in the sense of buying a TDR to maybe buy an extra floor. Um, maybe that would be additional 40 units, which would be additional 40 families. That, if you equate that to 40 homes, that's a lot of space when you go into a rural area at five acres per acre, or five acres per home. So I appreciate your visionary approach to this. Thank you for taking leadership. Problem is a city like Bothell could say we buy onto this and we're the ones who take all the growth and the other cities don't participate. But if you're leading the conversation, I think a lot of people are gonna be listening to that and wanna buy in. Um, so. Thank you for doing this, I appreciate it. My hope is that you could set up a meeting with like the city of Bothell, Kirkland, Redmond, even just for a visionary opportunity to say, we can buy into this and we can see the benefits of a region to do so. Because your presentation here tonight, I think, caused a lot of positive comments. And I think collectively, I think it would create a positive movement. So thank you guys. Thank you. Anybody else? Councilmember Sandberg. Well, they had posed at the end of their presentation some kind of council motion. I'm not exactly sure what action we take from here, but we um, we hear a lot about um, council, I mean, uh, staff's work program and how it's full. And we, like you mentioned, you know, we're, we're doing planning for the Canyon Park Regional Growth Center. So um, I don't know what action we would be taking here unless directing city staff to somehow moving forward with this, but um, I'm, I'm afraid that it would detract from, um, or it could complement um, the master planning that we're doing for the regional growth center at Canyon Park. Um, and I would support it in that um, respect, but not if it detracts staff time away from that effort or uh, city money away from that effort to to master plan um, that area so I, I we didn't get anything in our packet today about this I mean we got that it was on the agenda but we didn't get any pre-meeting material so I'm not really comfortable taking any kind of action tonight um, I, I is it coming back to us as some kind of proposal within the work plan and within our budget um, well, you're not able to take any action tonight. This is just a special presentation. It was at the request of, of the two gentlemen before you tonight. And so there was no um, research done. There was no information that staff had. And so this is really an initial um, overview to, to catch the temperature of, of council. Is this something you'd like us to pursue? Um, so yes, it would be something that we would add to the work plan. If you'd like us to continue these conversations, I've met with these gentlemen a couple of times. We need to know from a majority of the council, um, and, and I would ask for a vote so that it's very clear if you would like us to continue um, having this discussion and bring something back to council for your consideration. And, and that could even be a study session, that could be, but it would be added to the work plan, and um, I'd have to work out who would work on that and how it would fit in. Mr. Mayor, okay. I may speak to that, that point. We, yeah. uh, we do want to respect the uh, the burden that this would um, entail in any city looking at this. This is a conversation we've had with several other cities around the region and hearing this presentation tonight, I think you have a flavor of the level of complexity that this program entails. Um, we certainly don't expect any city to develop the level of familiarity and mastery of, of the subject. I think that's some, a, a, a service that the counties and Torterra can offer in partnership moving forward, we can bring the technical, the technical expertise um, and the thinking around how to implement or pursue this program um, without really adding a whole lot of additional work for the city to, to understand or to think about. There's certainly a level of interaction of guidance and, um, and oversight and contribution to the thinking, but um, our way of approaching this in partnership with the city is, is that the county and Forterra try to do most of the heavy lifting. Okay, is there anybody else that, yep, Deputy Mayor? I guess in my mind, um, it would be something to add to potential DACA items for us to look at and prioritize for next year. 
that's what I believe the city manager would like to have a vote of the council. So I, I guess if we're gonna go there, I, I just wanna understand, so what percentage of the city are we really talking about here, like a, a acreage wise, or is it gonna be anywhere in the city? Obviously we're not trying to preserve, we're trying to bring more units into the city, and so it's not really, at least if we're working with the, um, the Forterra and King County, it'd be more to preserve more land in the rural areas outside of the city and bring the density into the city. Is that a fair statement? Yes, um, for the L clip revenues to accrue to the city, that's the model that, the, that's the revenue sharing model. Um, I would also be willing to offer my opinions, and I, I don't wanna speak for Forterra, but, but um, on how a city might also craft an in-city TDR program that was complementary to a county into the city TDR program because the, the point's been made several times and it's a really valid one that cities need open space within them as well. So so I think that there could be a way to look at that, but it we need to be clear that the in-city TDR program does not generate the revenue that's you know showing on the slide right now. It, it's um, a, a complementary program to it, but it, that's not the revenue generating program. But I think what you're, what you're getting at is is related to the regional program, and that's what we would um, look into further. All right. I mean, are we talking, you know? Oh, the acreage. Uh, acreage. I, I don't have the acreage off the top of my head, but um, it, it's, do, do you remember what the LIPA, LIPA, I used the term there, local infrastructure project area. What I can do is dig that out of the prior analysis and send that to, um, send that to Jennifer and, and get that, get that to you in that way. But um, in Seattle, for reference, it's the entire Denny Triangle, South Lake Union, and downtown office core zones. Um, the LIPA also includes the International District and um, basically runs from the stadiums to Lake Union um, to about I-5 is the, is the general area within the city of Seattle. Okay. So is there an interest in taking a vote on this to put it on the projected agenda? Councilman Fried? If I understand, there's two different issues. One would be to participate in the county program that's been discussed here as well as to generate a TDR program that would be for our city. Certainly Shelton View could benefit in that because there's DNR property as well as the uh, property to the north of that. You could buy the development rights or transfer development rights to preserve one, maybe develop the other. I'm not saying it's going to be. Same thing could happen with Wayne, um, back nine, transfer development rights, fully pay for the front nine. There's great mechanisms can happen with the transfer development rights, so maybe a consideration of both. Participating as well as our own. That'd be my motion to bring back for a conversation with um, city of staff, whether it's this year or with the new council, but it's important for the city of Bothell to participate in one way or the other. So there's a motion and a second. Uh, was that a second? No, and there wasn't a second, I'm sorry. Did you have something to say, Jennifer? I just wanted to be clear that, that the council slated to consider the purchase of the Wayne Golf Course on November 14th, and there would be no way to bring this information to you prior to that. Just that, I, Yeah, that I was just an example. Out, I know, but I didn't <laughs> want to put out expectations of potentially we could put this in place um, prior to that purchase, unless you wanted to delay the purchase. If you wanted to delay the purchase until later in 2018, that would potentially give us time. But at the, at the schedule that you've given me, um, that wouldn't take place unless you bump the schedule. Got it, okay. So seeing there's no second. Uh, I'll second it. Okay, and there's a second. So um, is there any discussion on the motion? Can I just reiterate my, um, if in taking this up and looking for an in-city TDR program and looking at participating in the county TDR LCLIP program, our tri-county region, that we do this with an eye um, in complementing the master planning for the Canyon Park Regional Growth Center, because that is where we have opportunity. You said this program works when you're planning for growth. And you know maybe we miss some opportunities with our great growth in downtown. Um, let's not make, make uh, or miss those same opportunities for, for Canyon Park, but don't detract from the Canyon Park master planning process either in time or money. Any further discussion on the motion, Deputy Mayor? Um, I'm, I guess I'm gonna reiterate, I, I don't wanna take time away from the things that we're already postponing that are really important, like affordable housing and tree retention policies. And so that's why I would 
Um, I don't mind learning more about it. I'm certainly interested, but I, I don't want it to usurp something else. And that's why I think it should be discussed in the docketing process next year. Councilmember Fried. I, I just want to emphasize, just like the clustering ordinance, I think it was a benefit to both the environment as well as developers. It's a way for us to take growth. It's also an affordable housing component. I think we certainly need a multifamily housing exemption uh, in regards to tax uh, that we need to focus on. We need to consider density here within the city uh, that's appropriate for our growth. I don't want to scare anybody, uh, but we do have a great downtown and other areas that we can consider. I, there's the Williams property on the slough that, or the Sammamish River. There's another place where I think the gun place was going to be that I saw for sale when I drove by the other day. There's a lot of these green spaces that could be great community parks that could be part of this program to, to transfer their development rights to go into certain core areas of our city. And I think it strongly should be considered because it's a way for us to acquire and preserve open space. Councilmember Spivey. Great, thank you. Um, I agree with Councilmember Sandberg with the our mass, you know, looking forward at the Canyon Park area and the growth, uh, um, the the replanning for that area. This is a great opportunity for that, uh, as well as the, we can use this to help bring um, bring in affordable housing. I mean, it, it's a mechanism when you when you can add when you can add density whether it's an opportunity to add affordable housing at the same time in that density in the multifamily home. So I think it's important that we do look at this because it is kind of a hand in glove with these those important things that the deputy mayor had mentioned. So uh, I support moving forward with at least the discussion on this. Councilmember McNeil. Uh, yes, I too agree with the colleagues in uh, support of this. Um, I think that uh, we have a, a very good opportunity right now, especially with the growth that we're about to see in the, the north end of our city um, and making sure that we take advantage of that growth in every opportunity we can uh, and being smart with that growth. Um, I do think uh, you had mentioned something about the executive and the things that he's trying to do. Um, I think that we're going to be hosting a meeting here on the 21st, that's this Thursday, um, with a, a group of people that are an advisory committee for uh, conserving land across King County. So uh, I encourage any one of the council members that uh, would like to participate in that to, to show up because I think it's a fabulous um, learning lesson on how we can work together across the region to do these types of things. All right, I think we've heard everybody talk that wanted to. Go ahead, place your vote. Passes unanimously. All right, so we're moving on to the, thanks guys for coming in, right. appreciate it. Thanks for your time. Thank yep. you. uh, council committee, re uh, I'm sorry, council committee city manager reports. Is there any, do you have one too? Okay, let's start with the city manager. I have two things this evening. One, I'd like to take the opportunity. Oh, he left the room. I wanted to thank, is, can you go get him? Okay, I'll go on to my next one. Um, I wanted to uh, let the council know that the city has been in conversations with Snohomish County um, Econo uh, Economic Alliance with regards to a uh, potential proposal from uh, Snohomish County with regards to the Amazon HQ2. Um, we are by no means leading this effort, but it is a conversation that we're a part of, and I'd like to bring some information to council on October 3rd with regards to our activities. I want to make sure I don't get out in front of the council with this conversation so that you understand what Snohomish County Economic Alliance is doing and what role Bothell potentially has with that and what areas are being considered um, in Bothell for a potential proposal. So I just wanted you to know that that, that would be added to the October 3rd agenda. The next thing is um, I'd like to thank Interim Chief uh, Ropke for um, serving as Interim Fire Chief for the last six months. Um, I, I really appreciate his integrity, his leadership, his willingness to um, really lead the department, especially with some difficult issues that we have and through the negotiations. Um, he's been a, a great uh, colleague and partner for me, learning about our fire department and, and in all the hoopla of getting a new chief, I don't want to forget and I really want to thank you for the last six months and um, I look forward, I'm so grateful that you're continuing. I think our new chief is incredibly fortunate to have such a a high quality, um, experienced, high integrity individual to be his number two as he transitions into this new position. And so I wanted to take the opportunity to thank you very much for serving as interim chief over the last six months. So thank you.
That's it. All right, uh, Deputy Mayor. Okay, um, I have I think three committee reports. Um, so Puget Sound Regional Council's Transportation Policy Board met last Thursday. Um, we got a financial strategy update on Transportation 2040. Um, there's an update required every four years. Um, so there's an updated revenues and expenses estimate. We're 41.5 billion dollars short um, between what is needed and the current law revenue. Um, it includes maintenance and preservation needs, um, regional capacity projects, and local system improvements. Um, the finance working group presentation, um, I'm sorry, recommendations incl uh, included a, um, s that we need something to replace gas tax revenues that are declining. And of the new possible res revenue sources, the committee is recommending looking into road usage charges, um, which would take legislative action. So in other words, um, there wouldn't be toll lanes anymore per se, but road usage charges. Um, and then there was a state facilities action plan on I-5 op, oh, I think that might actually be from my last my last one. Um, and then on July, um, I have, I opened the wrong one. Um, we also um, discussed um, on ETP, um, sorry, I seem to have lost my, <laughs> My report, hold on. Um, ETP, Washington Transportation, um, uh, and uh, came to discuss their freight plans. Um, Washington is the second most trade dependent state in the country. 1.4 million jobs in freight are in the state of Washington. 86% of packages are less than five pounds. Um, I thought that was interesting because they're talking about the opportunity for drone delivery. Um, Metro Fares Work Program came to discuss um, their their work on updating fares. Um, their recommendations include fare simplification with a flat fee of two dollars and seventy five cents, and no more zone or peak charges, um, with the advantage, obviously, of easier easier understanding, faster boarding, and for the most part, lower costs for many riders. Um, and then uh, a discussion about enhancing programs for very low income riders by subsidizing more tickets and um, reducing ORCA card fees. Uh, interesting facts include that only 30% of transit costs are borne by the users of transit. Um, a fare increase is likely in 2020. The reason they're able to do this flat fee is because um, they decided they didn't need to do a fare re revenue increase this time around. And then the other interesting fact I thought was the 9% of riders, only 9% of riders evade payment and they were including service dogs in that number. <laughs> I don't know how they did that. <laughs> um, apologies because I read, I read my last, last council report. So the Transportation Policy Board, um, we talked about the updates to the finance working group. Um, but there also is a, a brief update on regional centers framework, and I thought that was important. So currently, um, it's in draft form, but the recommendations by staff include um, having two types of centers, an urban growth center and a metro growth center with different, ca um, different requirements and targets for each. So the urban um, growth center would be probably more in line with what we're hoping for Canyon Park, and I think it's to be currently at 18 um, activity units and aiming for 30, and then um, metro is 30 and, and above. Um, and there was some discussion which we were uh, very interested in regarding existing regional growth centers that are not currently meeting their, their targets. So I think uh, our Canyon Park is at 14, we need to be at 18. Um, and so there was discussion, um, because we're not the only ones, about grandfathering in existing centers that, that aren't at targets with a time frame for compliance, five years or so, um, and or allowing existing centers to be exempt from density requirements um, when they're meeting other optional criteria. And um, there's a possible release on October 5th for public comment. Um, and then my final committee is the Arch Trust Fund Workshop, which was last Thursday. Um, so we probably know a lot of what we discussed uh, um, in terms of Arch's buying power being reduced to about half since the origin of the trust fund in the 90s. Um, the major discussion was about parity goals and a preliminary review of suggested ranges of donations by cities. Um, I expressed some concerns about the formulas for their asks from various cities. Um, 
Some cities um, that are accepting more growth are being asked sometimes to double their their contributions, while other cities that that claim to be finished developing and built out um, are seeing a reduction in their the asks. Um, and I I have a concern about that because I don't think it makes you less culpable um, if you're already built out. We still have an affordable housing issue um, that we all need to con contend with. So. Those are my updates. All right, great. Councilmember McNeil. Thank you. Um, Seashore, uh, this month we talked and had a presentation around the 2040 uh, update from Puget Sound Regional Council. Um, we also had the uh, same presentation, uh, Metro Fairs update from Jana, um, that was an ETP. Uh, and then we also had a pretty robust discussion around the interlocal agreement um, allowing the North End Cities to join Seashore as well as ETP. Um, and we're gonna be bringing that back uh, to vote in the next meeting. Uh, something that came out of that that was very positive is that they will, um, part of that agreement will allow us to present projects as we used to do in the past um, to one, not the other. So if we wanna to present to Seashore because it's more viable to the North End cities, we can present there or vice versa to ETP. So that gives us a little more leverage as a North End City depending on the project and where the project's at. Um, Deputy Mayor covered uh, ETP. Um, King County Land Conservation Advisory Group. Um, we heard a little bit about that tonight with the executives um, initiative to conserve and preserve lands throughout uh, unincorporated King County, but they will be meeting here at City Hall Thursday. Um, the 21st, that meeting will be from 4.30 to 7, I believe. I'm super excited that we're getting to host that because we will have leaders throughout the region here at City Hall discussing how we can work together across the region to do just what we were talking about here earlier. Regional Law and Safety Justice Committee actually will be held um, this month, um, next week in Auburn. So I will have an update on that um, at the next meeting. Uh, Public Issues Committee, uh, quite a bit went on in that uh, committee. Um, they have uh, nominated a new um, council member um, to be on the advisory committee uh, for Children and Youth Advisory Board. Uh, they also nominated another uh, member for Solid Waste Advisory Committee. Um, so Bill Boyce with Kent will be on the Children and Youth Advisory Board and um, a couple council members from the North End here um, in Kirkland will be in Lake Forest Park, will be on the uh, solid waste. Uh, there was a pretty robust discussion around regional centers. Uh, as well, Mayor Chris Roberts Shoreline asked about the proposal for grace periods uh, for jurisdictions to update their center plans and ongoing monitoring. Um, Council Member Margenson out of Redmond responded that the current expectation is that the plan updates would coincide with the next round of required updates to local comprehensive plans. Um, there were several questions around that from Mayor David Baker on whether they would be uh, discussing, the same discussion at PIC would be the same discussion that they're having with King County. So we should be hearing some more information on the Regional Growth Center soon. And I think the Deputy Mayor had talked about that a little bit as well. Uh, Veterans and Seniors Human Services Levy, uh, the Regional Policy Committee, King County Council, um, acted to unanimous, unanimously um, place the Veterans and Senior Human, Human Services Levy on the ballot in November. Um, if this is approved, the voters uh, replace a six-year property tax would be levied at a rate of 10 cents per thousand in assessed value. The current and original Veterans and Human Services levies were passed at a rate of five cents per thousand. For comparison, the current levy is expected to generate 18.6 million in 2017, whereas the replacement levy would anticipate 52.4 million if the levy proceeds in 2018. The 10 cent rate includes uh, a levy ballot measure um, is a reduction from the 12 cent that King County originally proposed. So it was 12 and now it's 10. Um, we heard a little bit about the Metro fares rate from the deputy mayor, so I won't cover that one. Um, something that very interesting that came up um, under the levies and ballot measure, um, Black Diamond uh, reported that there will be a recall December 5th concerning five council members. Um, mayor Ken Baring of North Bend noted that every seat in the city of Snoqualmie is up for election in November. 
And uh, Deputy Mayor Jay Arnold of Kirkland reported that Council Member Doreen Marcioni will be uh, retiring at the end of the year in celebration of her services. Um, she was also the former mayor of Redmond. So if anybody has the opportunity to join them on December 14th in Kirkland, that'd be fabulous. That's my update. Thank you. Okay. Is there any other committee reports? Seeing none, is everybody ready for a break or what? Uh, so we're going to take a break. We'll come back at, let's call it 8.20. And uh, so we're adjourned. Or I'm sorry, we're at break.